Hello, and welcome to another episode of the Opportunity Podcast. I'm your host, Greg Elfring, the head of marketing over here at Empire Flippers. And today I am speaking to Matt Zimmerman of ZimWriter. This is by far my favorite AI writing tool. And at this point, I've tested out a bunch of them. I actually thought that somebody was going to replace this as my favorite writer just because there's just so many of them. I kind of talk about that on the podcast, but I think Matt has done a remarkable job with this tool. And if you're interested in using AI, whether it's for an affiliate website, a local site, whatever, this might be a tool you'd be very interested in. I think it is fantastic. It has a lot of features in it. I don't see anywhere else. And it's one of the only AI tools where I personally don't get annoyed when I'm using it because I'm a very fast writer. And the way ZimWriter does does its work, its workflow, it just gives me mostly what I want. And then I can focus on editing it and making it better. So if that's something you are interested in, if you're curious on how you can use AI writing tools to speed up your content marketing, this is a great episode. Matt's a great guy. Very cool product. Very cool story. And we talk a little bit about the fast growth of his Facebook community. And the one thing that he says that I think is extremely helpful for any entrepreneur, no matter what you're doing, is how much he listened to feedback, how much he listened to like, you know, just doing networking, getting people to be beta users of his product, and really focusing on what the customers ask. Because you'll hear in his own story, the way ZimWriter originally began was only one core concept, which was making AI usable everywhere. And then through all that feedback, Matt started getting all these other ideas. And now his roadmap is probably very, very long because he has a very thriving fan base of community members over on Facebook. So with that said, enough of me talking. Let's get into the podcast. I'll see you on the other side. Okay, I have the myth, the legend, Matt Zimmerman, the creator and founder of ZimWriter. I've been wanting to get you on this podcast for a while. I, like I was telling you offline, I discovered your tool through a mutual friend, and I really am impressed with what you're doing, the community you built. I've played around a lot with ZimWriter myself. And I, like I said, I thought like, okay, there's probably going to be a better mousetrap that comes around, but because there's so many of them, right? So much AI exploding everywhere. But I'm still a huge fan. Like I think you nailed it for the most part, and I think you're continuously improving it. So I'm really glad that we got this podcast together. In fact, I'm more glad that it's happened after the launch because you've made so many updates since then. Oh, <laughs> but yeah. uh, for my audience that doesn't know you, I've kind of given it away a little bit. Tell them a bit about who Matt Zimmerman is and how did you get into this crazy world of SEO? So I, let's see. <laughs> I live in Ohio, so nice flat Buckeye state right outside the Toledo area. And there's not much around me. You have oil and you have farm fields. So that's kind of where I exist right now. But I tell you what, country living is severely underrated. And I love it out here. So unfortunately, there's not like, it's not like Silicon Valley. There's not like a lot of uh, smart people, like tech people, put it that way, tech people to like bounce ideas off of and stuff like that. So it's just all online for me. And I didn't start out in the SEO world. So I... I actually worked for the government. I worked for the patent, United States Patent and Trademark Office as a patent examiner. For the past 15 or so years, I, I went, went and I got my engineering degree and I said, you know what, I don't want to do this. I said, I like to argue, let me go get a law degree. And I'm like, I don't like to do this. <laughs> Hindsight's 2020, right? <laughs> and my wife steered me to the patent office because, you know, maybe that's like the entrepreneurial blood in me or something. And but I've been there for 15 years. I really enjoy it. ZimWriters allowed me to go part-time there now, but that's where I do spend half of my week working for the patent office. And, you know, kind of getting started with SEO, I knew that that wasn't like where I wanted to stop. You know, I, I wanted to do something like my father's side of the family, they're all entrepreneurs, they're all doing something. And I don't know, I just had this urge to do something. And ever since I was a kid, I, I wanted to. So I think about eight years ago, I don't know how I started learning about SEO, but I, I knew there was this online way to make money, put it that way, that, you know, you could come home at the end of the day and you didn't feel like dirty, you know, <laughs> you did something <laughs> disingenuous. So I, I started learning more about SEO and I'm like, this is kind of cool. And I did the whole stereotypical path of online marketing. I said, okay, people just want to hear what I have to say. So I made the website just about anything and no, that's not true. There's no SEO focus. There's no focus at all. No one wanted to read that. So I learned more and more about SEO and started to make more and more niche tailored sites with the right kind of focus. And 
as that kind of grew, I dabbled more in just other avenues. Like I, I made a lawyer directory, made some other websites, and then finally AI came onto the scene and I ended up making a course for Phrase. It was making, I don't know if you know Phrase, it's like Surfer, mm -hmm. but I was making a, an SEO course for Phrase and that did really well. And then I started training people on AI and then I made ZimWriter out of the blue. <laughs> Didn't wake up one day and said, oh, I'm going to make an AI writer. It just <laughs> kind of happened. And so that's kind of where I am today. I'm, you know, managing a part-time job, software development, PR, YouTube videos, trying to find time for my family all in between. Yeah. I saw your post in the community about going on vacation and then the bug yeah. that made you get your laptop back yeah. out. And oh everyone's <laughs> like, you're probably one of the only software founders I've seen where like the software goes down and your community is like, it's okay, Matt, just take vacation. <laughs> <laughs> we'll wait for you, <laughs> which I want to yeah. get into because that's very impressive. Uh, like at Empire Flippers, we have a pretty good customer service. Like we don't usually get like crazy negative stuff. I have a friend, she used to work for me and now she works for another SEO tool and she worked in their customer service department and she's like, oh, this is a nightmare. <laughs> like the things that people <laughs> say to me are awful. <laughs> oh man. So uh, you're in an awesome place in terms of your community, at least. I want to get into the community because I'm very curious on the launch. But before I do, tell me a bit, how did the idea for ZimWriter come? So you're making a course for phrase, an on-page optimization tool. And then you say, suddenly you engineer this thing, but you must have been teaching yourself AI for a while, right? Like, so tell me a bit about that journey. So it, well, it all started with phrase. Back in the day, open AI was a lot more expensive. And so you had some companies, phrase was one of them, and they implemented GPTJ, which is like a smaller, I think it's like 7 billion parameters or something. So a smaller AI model, it's a lot less forgiving. And so to get that AI to do what you wanted to do, you had to feed it these samples, we call them templates. And so I was spending hundreds of hours developing, designing and learning how to prompt, I guess, the AI using these templates, because, you know, I just like phrase. And so I really cut my teeth on the it's like I tried to ride a bicycle without training wheels at all, you know? So it was a lot harder to do than if you're trying to teach yourself prompting with GPT-3, because with GPT-3, it's so forgiving that you can make a lot of mistakes and not really know that you're making these mistakes. So I got a lot of the experience from prompting by using phrase, developing templates in phrase. But then I think the idea for ZimWriter just came about by tinkering. The big problem, you know, I'm, I'm one of those like OCD people in terms of I like certain things about interfaces. So phrase, you know, every AI writer has their own interface. Jasper has their own interface to type, to bold things, to highlight, to, you know, whatever. Phrase has theirs. All these tools have their own. And some of them are, have the good features. Some of them have bad features. I'm like, I really just want to use AI wherever I want. I don't want to be tied down to a specific interface. And so I actually started tinkering on the Mac. And that's, if you want to say like, what's the genesis for ZimWriter? actually started on a Mac. There's a that's software That's very called... ironic considering all the community <laughs> posts are a Mac version of ZimWriter. <laughs> yes, yes. But you have to understand like the first iteration of ZimWriter was simply using AI anywhere, using it anywhere on your desktop and using it in basically any website, tens of millions of websites on the mm -hmm. internet. I mean, that's what you can do with ZimWriter now, but that is the very first functionality of ZimWriter. It didn't have all these other features in it. And so there's a software called Keyboard Mastero. I don't know if you know it. It's for Mac. It allows you to like remap your keys and there's some scripting built into it. So I was like, well, maybe I can reach out to OpenAI and contact OpenAI that way and then map the request to a keyboard key. And that worked. And I was like, this is pretty cool. But it's not something that you can compile and then package and then sell. You know, it's something really, you know, technical and not very user friendly. So I didn't grow up knowing programming. You know, I've dabbled in basic, Pascal. And then back in the day, I made some aimbots for Counter-Strike Go. And that, was, that was kind of the extent of my programming languages. But I was like, you know, I know this language for Windows. And I think I could probably build something. And so I started tinkering with it. And I built this first iteration of ZimWriter for the PC. And I guess the rest is kind of history right there. That's awesome. First of all, Counter-Strike Go, I guess you're destined to work in the SEO world somehow. So <laughs> I, have a, I have a friend, he, he's hired very like all-star player SEOs. And one of the interview questions he asks them is, what video games do you like to play? And if oh. they say something like Counter-Strike or StarCraft, they're like, 
this person's in. <laughs> like, <laughs> that's, but, like awesome. that's their thing. Like if they play Dota, like that's my guy. He's gonna like no life this SEO game like crazy. <laughs> That's an, it, that's an interesting. It's like one of those weird ranking factors from the Yandex yeah, index that yeah, you just didn't know. Time. You know, yeah. it's the LSI of a of a talented SEO. <laughs> How deep into the video game are they? <laughs> yeah, that's interesting. Yeah, yeah. I was a big StarCraft Warhammer guy myself, so mm. I'm on the creative side of the SEO world, though not as much on the technical. But so, as you come up with ZimWriter, you start cobbling this all together. And this is a pretty crowded market, right? Because like the, some of the first AI tools I started really pumping out this year as the craze of ChatGPT and OpenAI became more mainstream was all writing tools. So how yeah. did you make ZimWriter different? Like, what was your battle plan to make it stand out in such a crowded place? You know, I thought, and it's weird. It's like there's all kinds of people that want to use AI. You know, the majority, I said the majority, the people that knew a lot about AI almost before chat GPT were us, the SEO people, the people that needed to generate content, you know, like my dad, he didn't know about open AI. He didn't know about GPT or stuff like that, or AI, but it started as kind of this idea of, I just want to use AI anywhere. You know, I didn't know where I, I would be able to take this thing, but I knew that there was people that probably wanted the ability to use AI in Twitter and LinkedIn and Google Docs and Gmail and all these different places. And that's where Microsoft is going now. They're bringing at least some form of AI. Now it might be limited to just GPT 3.5 Turbo. I don't know. But they're bringing some form of it to the desktop. So you kind of see, you know, I want to say like we're ahead of the game over here. But you see that's kind of where it's going because the universalness of AI, it's going to get into every nook and cranny of our lives. And it's going to start on the desktop. And so I think... I had the initial idea, I want to be able to use it there because that's valuable. You know, I want to use it in all these websites because that's valuable. I don't want to have to leave my browser, leave my train of thought, take whatever I want, go to this tool, hunt around for the template I want, because a lot of these tools, they're very constrained. They're not raw input into the playground. And so the output that you're going to get is constrained by their prompts and whatnot. So you'd spend five minutes logging in. I had copy AI. I don't know if I can say this on the radio or on the podcast. But I had copy AI, and I let's I start love, some AI fights. <laughs> oh man, I love the tool, but dear me, I don't know how many millions of dollars are worth. But I hate the stupid magic link. The magic link to log in. You gotta. I can't just go there with my one password. Just log into their site. I have to go there, and it's like, hey, enter your email. Get a magic link. So I do that, and then I go to my email. I have to log in there, and I have to get the magic link, and I have to click back. It's just, it's a pain. And I said, I just want AI running all the time, waiting for me. And that's kind of where it started. And I think that's valuable. I think a lot of people found that valuable. But then the people like us are like, hey, can you have it write bulk blog posts? And I'm like, well, let's find out. <laughs> that's cool, man. I agree with you. I think that's like one of the unique things about ZimWriter. So from my audience out there listening in, you made the decision to not be a hosted SaaS style business model, which is what most of them do. They're in the cloud, right? Yours can literally I can press like control C, the magic command or whatever it is. And AI is just right on my computer because the software actually lives on my computer, which I'm assuming right. is one of the ways you did the workaround to make it be everywhere. Is that how you like came with the idea that it should be on a local server? Yes. And because of just my technical limitations, you know, I'm like, <laughs> you know, you know, th uh, there, there's two. I would have done a SaaS, but I don't know how to do that. <laughs> <laughs> don't know how that to do that. <laughs> my, my MVP kind of worked out. You know, <laughs> there's something to be said for, I think I got very lucky in putting myself in the box that I'm in because I can sell a lifetime deal, for instance, to my software and I have no hosting costs. There's some license checks and stuff like that every couple hours, but that's it. So these other companies, I was a big AppSumo fan, and you'd have all these lifetime deals, and a lot of them would go bust because they're all SaaS tools. They're all hosted. They, you can't afford that unless you start bringing up your monthly recurring revenue, and I don't have that problem. So it's fortunate that I got myself into the box, but one of the main reasons was I just didn't have any other ability to code a SaaS, <laughs> SaaS tool. <laughs> I think it all worked out well, man, because that hosting cost, so me from a valuation perspective, one of the things that buyers of SaaS businesses pretty much absolutely hate across the board is lifetime deals. If they see like a big 
squad a, a cohort of people that way they hate that because of exactly what you're saying now if it's on something that's on you know someone's server where they don't have to pay the hosting cost that's a bit of a different story for sure because they don't have the cost like you mentioned so yeah i think it was good also it reminds me a bit i don't know if you were around the seo world for this but when i first got into seo i was using tools like se nuke which is like this very black hat tool that just like shutter mm. out links all sorts of different crazy stuff but it lived on your computer too. It had like a bit of a weird UI, like old. And your the Zim Writer's UI reminds me of like old school, like internet marketing tools. So there's a bit of a nostalgia there for me. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's like it, well, you know, Screaming Frog is a really big tool in the SEO industry, and it, it has that very old school. It does archaic, you know, gooey vibe, but people use it because it works. Yeah, I showed my team Screaming Frog, some of the newer content specialists on my team. And they're like, what am I looking at? Like, you're looking at magic. <laughs> <laughs> this is absolute magic. What do you mean you don't like this design? It's great. <laughs> they just get so intimidated by it, right? Look at these yeah. like old school Microsoft Windows. <laughs> yeah, where, where's, and, my, where's my gradients and stuff like that? I want my logos <laughs> and stuff. And like, no, no, you don't need any of that stuff. <laughs> Trust me, you're going to love this. <laughs> so you code a ZimWriter yourself. It sounds like it started off as AI Anywhere. And I'm assuming you must have shared it with some people. And then they asked about the blog uploader. So tell me about a bit of the story before the launch of ZimWriter. Like, what were you doing? So I started it in early December of 2022. And I spent about a month developing it and then asking just so you know i mentioned app sumo and there was a, some facebook groups i was in and i tell you what just networking online is phenomenal like i built you know you don't realize this stuff until you actually need it and so i had networked with a lot of individuals through in these lifetime deal communities and a lot of them were giving me great feedback about things i don't remember the specifics but they were giving me some really good feedback and I can't remember if we launched with just the right anywhere. I think we might have launched with a bulk, right up to 10 blog posts at a time and a one click blog generator. I don't know if the SEO writer was in there, but you know, I'd release something and then I'd get some feedback on it. And then some, I think someone said, Hey, you know, can we have it right with keywords? And I said, no, that's impossible. And I, I'll usually do that. I'll, I'll say, not like no, one of the main features of ZipWriter. <laughs> I'm like, no, that's impossible. You can't do that. And then I, I'm like, well, wait a second. You know, maybe, maybe that's possible. So you start tinkering some more with the AI. And it's amazing what you can do with the AI. Like, you know, and it's all incremental steps. You know, you take a couple steps in this direction and you see, okay, yeah, this is kind of working with the prompts. This is kind of coming together. Let's take it a couple more steps, you know. And that's just been kind of the evolution of the whole software. I have ideas for the future. But a lot of it is just a couple steps at a time, see what the community thinks, and then pivot. I don't want to build nonsense, you know, stuff that nobody's going to use. I think one of these mm. tools, they have like a, a love poem generator for your girlfriend. I'm like, why? <laughs> I think why that's would, Jasper. Why would you, right? <laughs> uh, there's a couple. So I'm like, I mean, that's cool, but why would you make that? Like, what kind of functionality is that for a user? Is someone going to sign up to Jasper because they can write a love letter to their girlfriend? I mean, come on. <laughs> That's their USP. I made a joke <laughs> on uh, LinkedIn when ZimWriter launched because I was very impressed with it. And I, I made a joke saying that the first jobs that AI is going to replace is the old AI tools. Because <laughs> 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 I, I, like, I'm not a fan of Jasper. Like, you know, I'm not sort of trying to throw any flack at them as a company. I think they're a great company. Just I wasn't a fan of the tool. Like, I'm a very fast writer. But with something like Jasper and other things of that ilk, like, we get frustrated how slow it was to make like a long form blog post that was like readable and like decent. And it was often just faster for me to just write it myself. And that's the way AI was for me until about this year, really, where everything seemed to like turn and like, oh, this is actually pretty dope now. I have a question and I don't want you to give away any of your proprietary prompting or anything like that, but I'm curious on how it works on the back end of it all. So with Jasper, I always assumed that they were like calling the OpenAI API with their own little prompts in their playground and then feeding it into what you have. So like on the back end, are you doing specific prompting for it to work with the commands in the actual tool? Yeah. So, and this gets me into kind of 
where I'm going with the future and the Mac version and why it's, it's going so slow. I think developing an AI software is very, very unique in the world of software development. If I wanted to make an MP3 player, for instance, I would say, okay, I'll hire a developer and I'll say, okay, I want something that's going to play these MP3 files. And I want a play button and a forward and a back and a pause and a playlist and all these very concrete things. But AI is completely different in that the prompts are so intertangled with the code and they change almost on a model by model specific basis. And I'll give you an example. We released this feature called Penny Arcade. You can put up to a thousand URL into it. You go to somebody's sitemap. You know, I'm not going to encourage you to go to somebody else's sitemap, but you could do that if you wanted to. <laughs> <laughs> you put in all their URLs. And it doesn't, now it doesn't work well with listicles or product roundups or like step-by-step, -step, like, you know, five steps to plan a, a rose garden or something, but everything else like news articles or just general uh, non-structured posts work great. So you can put up to a thousand URLs in there and you press one button, you can set some options too, and then it will go out and crawl all those websites, all those URLs, and then summarize it. And then write based on that summary, a whole brand new article that uses that factual data that it got. So by default, I call it the Penny Arcade because it's using GPT 3.5 Turbo, but every model is different. And so I discovered that in certain situations, you would get, and so the way I code it is I don't send one prompt to open AI and say, okay, write this entire article because the AI won't do that. It mm -hmm. can't remember all the different rules. And then also you won't get long output for each subsection, like each H2 or each H3. So you really have to build it piece by piece. And I've noticed that in doing that, it would treat each piece, each subsection, each H2 or whatnot, as its own separate article. And this came out, this was more visible with GPT 3.5 Turbo, because it would add the words like in conclusion or finally at the end of it, you know? So I'm like, okay, I didn't experience this before because I typically don't use Turbo. I'll use DaVinci or I'll use GPT-4. And you don't get that kind of layout. So back to your question, there are all kinds of model specific situations and problems that can arise that need to be dealt with. But then to get quality output, I call it randomness. You need randomness. As humans, we write randomly. I use one of the hallmark features of ZenWriter is literary devices. There's over 500 variations of literary devices, metaphors, similes, onomatopoeia, all this stuff. You check the box. And what ZenWriter will do when you check the option to enable literary devices is it will choose at random a subsection to insert a literary device. And then when it chooses, okay, for this subsection, I'll use a literary device. Let me pick one at random then. Because no one writes a blog post with a metaphor in each specific subsection. They'll use it randomly. So to get high quality output, and this is what sets ZimWriter apart. I don't see this happening in any other AI tools. Although, you know, some of the newer ones like Agility Writer, I'm not too familiar of. They might be doing it, I'm not sure. You have to layer on this randomness. You have to say, okay, for this situation, I'm going to add a metaphor, and then I'm going to skip a literary device for the next couple subsections. But for this subsection over here, I'm going to add a bullet list. In this subsection over here, I'm going to add some H3s. You know, and then it starts to read more like a human written article. And so I think your question was, you know, how do I send this on the back end to open AI? There's such a intermingling of the prompts with the code that it's very difficult for me to go in and just have a developer say, okay, go make this for me, All right? Because it's not like making an MP3 player. It's like you're kind of making art almost, and it's all tied together. And you need one of two things. You need a developer who's a very good prompter or a prompter who's a very good coder, or you need a prompter to sit behind over the shoulder, your coder, and basically guide him all the way, you know? That's tough, especially with it being so new. Like I imagine most engineers at most have like six months of AI experience. <laughs> right. And, you know, a lot of programmers are, they're introverts, you know, they don't usually write blog posts and stuff like that. And there's nothing wrong with, it. I'm an introvert myself, you know, I hate writing. <laughs> so it's destroying my soul over here, man. I've like got started marketing as a writer. <laughs> no, I, I, oh, well, no, I, I have. So I, I've really gotten into like all the different marketing books I have. I got, what's it called? Breakthrough Advertising by Eugene Schwartz behind ah, me. You know, I'm really, legend. I'm digging that stuff now and I'm trying to get better at that. So I'm just not good with these long form blog posts and stuff like that. It's always been a struggle of mine. 
So coders, programmers, they're not really good at that kind of stuff. And so it's hard for them to see, you know, okay, you know, let me use all these different literary techniques and things like that to develop this really beautifully written piece of content. It's hard to do. Yeah, absolutely. It's funny. So I got started in marketing as a writer leaning into SEO because I liked it because you had to create content for it, right? So it was like a natural fit. I write novels and poetry for fun. We're friends on Facebook, so you probably have seen some of them. But yeah, like, so (laughs) I got started because I knew SEOs absolutely hated writing content. And so I (laughs) into all the groups when I was still on an oil rig, just like way undercharged. I actually wrote for a lot of plumbing companies in Ohio. So familiar. Oh, wow. (laughs) (laughs) I was up in the Arctic Circle writing about how to clean pipes in Dayton, Ohio. (laughs) Small world. But yeah, Yeah. that's fascinating. I could see it being very difficult to try to like kind of tame the dragon, so to speak. I have a friend, he's right now coding a golfing app and he has no idea how to code at all. And he's just using ChatGPT, like, tell me what to code. (laughs) So, like, he doesn't know if it's buggy or not. Then ChatGPT, like, forgets what was going on before. Yeah. So then it creates all these other problems. Are you using AI to help you figure out how to prompt the AI better? Are you using AI in the actual coding and development of ZimWriter? No, I am not because the language I'm coding in, it wasn't trained on. So I'm redeveloping it in another language, a cross-platform language that will work on Mac and will work on PC, one unified interface. It's going to be awesome. Looking forward to it. But I'm teaching myself the language. And I don't want to reveal what it is, but Google's BART was trained on it. So I plan on using that heavily as I delve deeper into, into its issues and whatnot. Very cool. Have you experimented with other LMs outside of OpenAI with ZimWriter? Like you mentioned Google Bard. Is there any other that you've experimented to see what the results would be with ZimWriter? You know, I haven't. And the, the only reason is I hate friction for users. And there's enough friction with updates. And I mean, you don't truly understand the complexity of a customer service representative until you act as a customer <laughs> service rep. I'll have people, and I mean, bless their hearts, you know, they'll be like, yeah, it's not working. And I'm like, and they'll send me a photo, a screenshot. And I can see it in the little, I don't know what you call it, the Windows URL bar, but for file manager, I can see like, the path they're in. They're like inside of the zip file. I'm like, well, you got to unzip the file. You know, it won't work unless you unzip the file. <laughs> and so it's just like, you know, there's all types of people. I, I love dealing with the people that just are savvy and they can just get it and I can walk through the debugging steps really quickly, but there's all kinds. And so it's hard to deal with that. Yeah. I, I mean, you're still solo, right? You're the only person. Do you have employees now or what's that situation? So, so I have a moderator, Bharat. He's phenomenal. He's from India. He takes care of the ZimWriter group from a, like a customer service rep standpoint. We've got 80, 500 people in there right now. It's just, it keeps growing. Yeah, I want to talk about that in a second. Brat's cool. I like him. I didn't realize he was helping you out. Yeah, he helped me out for free for like two months. And I said, dude, like, you're really helpful. Can I pay you something? And so he's first and only paid moderator. And my <laughs> wife was actually a moderator. And she's like a PR representative for me, you know. <laughs> and I'm a little lower loose with my language. And, you know, I'm a fun guy, you know. So. That was difficult. And so she's not a moderate anymore. She's still, in the group. she's still in the group. I remember I was one of those guys, I think, that sent you a message on Facebook for the customer service stuff. I think it was with the Penny Arcade. I was trying it out just as an experiment. I was like, yo, Matt, this is like only went to like 10 articles or something like that when I was experimenting with it. You're like, well, did you do this? And you linked it, the blog post that you're supposed to read and watch. I'm like, yeah, I probably should have listened to the instructions. I didn't do any of that. <laughs> I do or watch the video. (laughs) I just like, let's give it a spin. (laughs) So, yeah, you meet all kinds, even people like that. You know, it's just, you got to give everybody grace. But Barat's been a real help. And then I have a developer in Poland who maybe he'll put five hours in a week or something like that, laying a foundation for the Mac version. I said, I hired him months ago, but he hasn't been flaky. I mean, he's been a good guy. I just haven't given him enough stuff to do. And the reason is, as I develop ZimWriter, I kind of, you know, you do something one time and you realize, okay, how you should have done it in hindsight, you know? And so I'm kind of reformulating in my mind how I would lay that foundation again. So 
so he's been kind of laying that foundation for me. And we have like hotkeys now working in both platforms. We have our basic interface. We can do a blog post, but then all the intricacies in there, I'd like to get up to speed with the language and that I can then incorporate that stuff. But aside from him and then aside from Barat, it's just me and that's it. Yeah, that's an extremely bare bones team considering the size of your customer base based on the Facebook group. <laughs> Let's talk about that real quick. So did you have an actual launch plan? Because I think I found you through our mutual friend, Sheeler. I think he was talking about it. And I actually thought he was partners on it until you told me, no, he's just like an affiliate. Like, oh, wow, he did it very well. I thought it was like his. <laughs> he didn't even want to be an affiliate. He just wanted to, to advertise it. He just really likes it, ah. apparently. Oh, very cool. That seems like something he would do. But yeah, so I found you through him. Did you have a marketing plan? Because your Facebook group grew amazingly fast. Like, tell me a bit about, about that. I have no experience in this. You know, I'm an introvert who two years ago, before I made a phrase course, I'm like, I'm not going to be on YouTube. Why would I want to be make a YouTube video? That's just <laughs> put my face on YouTube. No way. I'm like looking at these AI avatars. I mean, like, you know, and then you step out little by little and you say, well, you know, let me try it. And then you're like, ooh, I need to get a new camera. I need to get a new mic, you know, and you start leveling up, so to speak. And I'd never run a Facebook group. I was like, well, you know, but you have to have a Facebook group if you're going to, I don't necessarily like being on Facebook to have like, everybody's like, go to Discord or something. Well, a lot of people that I think use them, right, or don't know what Discord is. They don't know how to use that kind of stuff. So I think Facebook was kind of like the universal, like, you know, it is what it is. And we just kind of started in there and it just started growing by word of mouth. I think I've done ads. I did like an ad for a week, you know, and that was about it. It's all simply been word of mouth. And then also I'll make YouTube videos. So I'll push out a release. I'll make some YouTube videos. People watch the YouTube videos, come to the group or people, you know, you heard, you know, from a friend and say, so you join the group. So it's kind of like word of mouth right now, just grassroots movements. That's amazing, man. So we tried to do a Discord group. It failed spectacularly. It's still there. We were debating between a Facebook group and Discord. If I would have done it again, I think I probably would have did a Facebook group. Because one, mm. I think Facebook groups just grow a lot more virally than a Discord group does. Though Discord has a lot more advantages, like in terms of moderation and management, like the tools to actually like, yeah. you know, moderate the group. So maybe down the road, you should do a Discord for like people or like power users get you in. But I think Facebook groups themselves, because I think once you get over 500 members, Facebook will actually start promoting your group for you for free, like in the organic oh. space. So yeah, <laughs> so it works really well from a marketing perspective. Like the one yeah. thing Facebook still has over all other social media is groups. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. I mean, that's where a lot of the marketers are. You know, if you're not on Facebook, then you're missing a big chunk of the pie, even though it, it's a very cumbersome interface and whatnot. Yeah, I had a friend. He used to be the CMO of a pretty big company. Now he's doing his own thing, but. He told me, like, why are you not on Twitter? I, like, because I'm personally not on Twitter. Like, I never use it. I mean, I use the EF Twitter now and again. But I was like, dude, it's all about Facebook groups in my niche. Like, all the best conversations happen in Facebook groups. And they're often, like, private groups or, like, masterminds or something like that. So, yeah, Facebook is still where it's at as far as I'm concerned for, like, the deeper, meaningful yeah. conversations. So you mentioned you have a bunch of new ideas for Zoom Writer. Can you tell us a little bit what's on the roadmap? Oh, I'd have to pull the roadmap up. I have like, you know, I have like my, my, my 12 month roadmap. And then I have my, oh crap, it's the end of it. Zimwriter, when it first started, I was doing updates, like whenever I felt like it, like, you know, very quickly. Oh, geez, I haven't checked the group in three days. There's <laughs> five updates, you know? <laughs> and some people love that, but other people, again, who don't know how to unzip a file, because this is desktop software, you'd have to go to my web and it's not auto updating. And that's, okay, I'll do a tease for your viewers. That's something I'm trying to work on right now because <laughs> having a way for it to, you know, you click a button and it, it brings you the new version, that'd be fantastic. But I found that updating the software was very, very difficult. So I'll shoot now. I decided, let me try to do an update once a month. One big update that's going to encapsulate a lot of different new features and whatnot. And that's been going well. The only struggle is obviously you will encounter a bug, you know, and it's just, I have a subset of beta testers, but you know, they're not paid. And so they're kind of just eager to get the new version and use it. <laughs> so there's like one of them in, in there that's a really, really good beta tester, but you really kind of have to release the version to like a thousand different Zen writers 
and then someone's like, oh, hey, this feature doesn't work, and a couple of people chime in, because we're dealing now with thousands of different Windows configurations. We're dealing with people using it on Mac through crossover or parallels or VPS or something. So you don't really flesh this stuff out for a couple of days after the release, and then you get a couple of patches. So I try now to do one update a month and then a couple of patches on the side. In terms of like my long-term plan, you know, I'd like to, well, the short-term plan first, I'd like to have some kind of a bulk SEO writer. That's tricky because right now the SEO writer will allow you to add background information. And so for each of the H2s and then also a global background, one of the difficulties with that is if, how do you feed that in in bulk into ZimWriter? You can't do a CSV file because if you're feed, feeding in like a 500 word background section, that's going to have commas in there. You know, so how can you create some kind of a file in bulk then to send ZimWriter? It's not exactly easy. So I'm thinking more of a, like a queue system that you could, you know, queue up blog post number one, queue up blog post number five. So you queue up five posts and they're all saved. So hopefully if it crashes, you know, you open it back up and everything's still there, but then you can press one button and then go to work, come back and all your five or your 10 blog posts are written. So that's something I'd like to accomplish soon. I have other like other minor things I'd like to, well, and this, I'll kind of reveal this a little bit. I'd like to do a little bit more with YouTube stuff. I think scraping and summarizing YouTube videos would be very interesting and then turning those into articles. So if you wanted to go and repurpose all your YouTube videos or your podcast, well, I guess that's podcasts, right? But if you had a bunch of YouTube videos, you could repurpose them all as articles very easily. And then the long-term stuff is, that's all, I obviously want to get the Mac version done, the unified code base. I want to have multiple languages. And that's one of the big struggles I have right now. A lot of users are like, why can't I feed in non-English stuff into ZimWriter and get non-English out? Because right now you have to feed in English into ZimWriter and get non-English out. And the reason is because I'll be like, I go to ChatGPT and I type in like something in German and I'll get German out and it's great. German in, German out, no problem. The problem is all my prompts on the back end are in English and you can't mix languages. So if I'm going to feed in 50% of my prompt in English and 50% of it in German, you're going to get a mixed output. You're not going to get good output. So I'll need a way to separate out the prompts from the actual code and then have multiple translations for each of the prompts, which is hard in and of itself because I'll change the prompts every month. Every month, the prompts are changing either because of the models or I've improved them. And that's why coding it is so freaking difficult because you get a coder, he has to know the prompting or, or I have to be watching over his shoulder because it's just so intertwined. So we have the language thing that I'd like to add. And then I want to, and I don't want to reveal all of it, but I want the community to be more involved in the actual prompting. I want to give more power to the users. And a lot of people are like, Matt, why can't I just add my own prompts to your stuff? And they just don't understand that. And I have thousands of hours prompting. They don't understand that it's basically like art. When you paint a painting, it's only going to look good when you're the one painting it. If I say, hey, come along and throw on some paint, it's not going to look good because it's no longer my painting. It's our painting, and it's just not going to mesh well. Same thing with the AI. People start throwing these prompts in, and I've seen some absolutely garbage prompts out there. <laughs> and we could talk about that in a moment, but there's a lot of garbage out there. And they're going to put that in, and it's going to screw up the output. But I have ideas. And I think something might come next or in two weeks that might enable users to add their own prompts in a way that's not going to totally hose it up. Ah, that's awesome. I'm very excited for the bulk SEO writer idea. I think your solution of the queue system makes a lot of sense. I would love it to be more than five, of course, but that does allow you to use it in a whole unique way. Because like right now with the bulk blog writer, I think you can go up to a thousand, but I feel like you really need to make those titles have the intent of the article for the AI. Otherwise, you might get something that's like not as related to your niche as you hoped, right? Because if you're giving it like a cool clickbaity copywriting title that doesn't exactly tell what it is, how's the AI going to like know what this is? <laughs> yeah, like you're using clickbait. Like you won't believe what they did. Like the AI is going to write like, you, yeah, <laughs> you won't believe what they did. It's wild. It could be totally different yeah. than what you meant, right? So that's super exciting. I think that is cool. I also like that you went to a uh, monthly updates getting, I think that makes just everything more organized, right? 
But let's switch a little bit into the benefits of AI and the cons of AI, because as you probably know, being a founder of a AI software, this is a pretty controversial subject across the SEO communities, which I think is very interesting. Like there's a guy that basically tried to rip me apart on LinkedIn when I mentioned that you could have a whole content marketing team for cheap or next to nothing. When I used a chat GBT, Zim writer, uh, I think I also put a Pictory and 11 labs. So you could have this whole thing going for you. And he was like, no, you can't. It's all trash. I was like, no, it's not. <laughs> like you, you just don't know how to use the tools. Like, and I get it, man. I'm a writer. Like I get the pain you're going through the existential crisis here. Cause AI is already good enough in my view to replace low level copywriter up to maybe even intermediate in certain niches. I don't think it replaces expert level yet. And that's where the human assist really comes in. But I actually wrote a blog post about, you know, did AI just kill affiliate marketing when, you know, everyone thought Google was going to die overnight because of chat GPT. And I used Zimwriter for, I think, 200 or 500 words of that article. And at the very end of it, and it was a piece of the article trying to tell the reader that AI writing is already so good, you won't realize it's AI. And I put it in mm -hmm. as raw input. At the very end of that section, I said, everything just above was written completely by AI, unedited by me, by the way. <laughs> and I had a bunch of our, our fans who read the blog was like, oh, that totally got me. I thought that was totally you because they're just like so enthralled in the article, right? They're just moving along. But I was trying to make a point, like these tools are already like so good. But tell me what your thoughts are on this, like the benefits of AI writing, where people should really focus on and the drawbacks, maybe something that they need to be careful of when they're using an AI writer. I think the benefits are it's going to help poor writers like myself write faster, you know. So i give you a real world example. People are like, what do you use ZimWriter for? I'm like, I don't have time to use ZimWriter. I'm too busy. <laughs> I'm <making laughs> stupid <laughs> thing. Like, what do you think I'm blogging on the side of ZimWriter? Right? I don't have time. <laughs> just letting the ball, you just got to let the bulk go all day long, man. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, buddy, I don't have time for this. So I had to make these exhaustive guides. And so these guides on how to use my software. And this is something like AI just does not know about it. And you'll get all kinds of people. They'll be like, well, how the AI just write without feeding it any information, stuff that it should not be writing about, like these very niche subjects. The AI has no idea about my software or whatnot. And so I didn't use it to, in that way, I didn't use it to write a blog post. I used it in its original way, which was I had a prompt and it basically said, rewrite the following stuff with proper grammar in the active tone of voice and in a conversational tone, you know? And that was the entire prompt. And I assigned it to a custom command, a custom keyboard trigger control four, I think. And so I just write down, like, I can get stuff from my head really quickly onto paper, but it's not going to sound right. You know, and there's going to be mistakes and things like that. So I'd write a couple paragraphs and I'd highlight the text and I hit control four and it would rewrite the stuff. And it was 95% of where I wanted it to go. And it would not make it not my own. It's like Grammarly on steroids. You know, it was doing it right inside of WordPress, which is great. So it's going to help poor writers write faster and write better. And you can just put your thoughts down and have the AI formulate those for you now. And that brings me to the risk. So you can use AI very methodically like I did and also like you did in your example, you know, but then you have a lot of individuals who either don't know anything about SEO or just have a very surface level concept of it. And they think if I just write a bunch of stuff, I'm going to make a bunch of money. You know? <laughs> And you're hearing this more now in the group now that ZimWriter has been out for a while. Some people are like, my stuff's not getting indexed. And other people are like, well, I'm not having any problem getting my stuff indexed. But then it's like, you know, it must be AI because I'm not getting my stuff indexed. And it's like, well, there's a little bit more to SEO than whether it was written by AI or not. So you're going to have a lot of people who are writing unhelpful content. A lot of these non-SEO people who have no idea and are going to be filling up the internet with this, just, this stuff that's just not helpful. And you're relying too heavily on the quantity and not the user satisfaction. I'm a big proponent of heat maps. Use Clarity on all my sites, Microsoft Clarity, free hot jar alternative. I like watching what my users are doing to see. And this is a great example. Like I had an affiliate site and watching the heat map completely changed how I structured the site. I realized no one's reading all the words. The words are on there just for what Google wants to see. And no one's even reading the product reviews. 
so I broke the article up into thirds. The first third was my six to 10 products, three bullet points about each product, just three word bullet points, you know, and then a buy now link and a photo of the product. 90, 95% of the people just looked at those pretty pictures, three features, buy now link. They didn't even scroll down to like the more detailed explanation and review of each product, you know? And so you've got to look at the heat maps. So if you're busting out a lot of content and Google's going to give you the benefit of the doubt when you first release your content, they're going to, you know, send some traffic there, but it's going to, if you're not getting good feedback from the users, they're going to de-rank you very quickly. And so you've got to look at what the people are doing. Are they bouncing from your site? Are they only reading like a third down? Are they reading the whole article and then jumping somewhere else on the site? And you need to look at these heat maps and you need to build a brand. Brand is what's going to set you apart from the competition with the AI. If everybody's using AI, you don't have a brand, then what really do you have? So yep. you got to deliver an experience too. You have to have something more than what, you know, and it's harder for some people that, you know, if you're non-English and you're catering to an English audience, is that going to go over as well? You know, so there are disadvantages to putting yourself in front of the camera and selling yourself as the brand, but you have to figure something out to distinguish you from the competition and build that mode around your business. The great advice. I mean, just in general, that's great business advice. There was one of my LinkedIn haters with my AI post. <laughs> they, uh, they told me all oh, AI is going to just like fill the internet with all the same content. Like creativity will die. I was like, have you not looked at Google lately? Like most of the contents that way already written by humans, <laughs> like it's already yeah, oh, there. Yeah. You know, if you look at a SERP, like a good SEO analysis, like say you want to rank for X keyword, you type it in and you notice all Google's ranking is listicles about that. Well, what are you going to create? You're probably going to create a listicle around that keyword. And you're probably going to include those things because in your search analysis, say it was like a top 10, top 11, top nine is what's showing up. And all of them included these six ones. Well, guess what you're probably going to include? Probably those six ones. So you're like, it's already like there, like the human version of it's already there. But I like what you said about using AI to create a better brand, a real brand. And I don't think someone has to like show their face to do that. I think there's all sorts of ways you can stand out using data, writing something creative, like yeah, you're writing the SEO articles, but then you might have like an article that pops up that's super interesting when that visitor comes on there. And that's something we do at EF, actually. We have a blog post, not AI, that's all written by me back in the day. We have <laughs> articles explaining like how does affiliate marketing work? How does AdSense work? How does FBA work? All that kind of stuff. And then when they get there, there will be different pop-ups or different call to actions within the blog saying like, here's how to speed up your entrepreneurship where you can start making profit today. And they click on that article and it's all about buying a business, right? So they're like, oh, this is fascinating. I never thought about doing it this way, but there was no SEO to that secondary article. I'm using the SEO as almost like an ad to that more creative article that's building the relationship with the readers. So yeah, I think people just need to be a bit more creative. The other thing you said too, I forget exactly what you just said, but an analogy I'm using that you made me think of, and I'm curious if you agree with this actually. So mm -hmm. I think AI is kind of like Photoshop, like with writing, with the videos, with 11 labs, with what they're doing with voices and, you know, mid journey with design. A lot of people are like, oh, all this, all these people are going to go away, all these jobs, all this stuff. And that's probably true to a certain extent, but I feel like Photoshop didn't kill the designer. All Photoshop eventually did was make a layman like me, who was really bad at design, be able to do small things well, and people who are really good at design suddenly create absolute masterpieces, right? So I feel like AI is going to be somewhat similar on that. What are your thoughts there? Well, I don't agree with you because Photoshop's freaking hard. So. <laughs> <laughs> I will say AI is a lot easier to use than Photoshop. Yes. I look at that thing, I get very intimidated. <laughs> I'm like, oh, geez, I got to do this in Photoshop. This is, oh, I I'm can't going do it. back to Canva. <laughs> <laughs> going back to Canva. Yeah. You know, AI is, well, you, know, you mentioned it with what you said also about how you had some articles that weren't SEO, but you were using the SEO to bring them into those articles. I think AI, AI is like a hammer. You know, it's another hammer in your toolbox, or maybe it's a new tool. Maybe it's a multi-purpose hammer with a screwdriver on the back or something like that. It's a and new really tool in your hands. toolbox. <laughs> with really weird yeah. The journey joke. <laughs> and, oh, with really, yeah. Six fingers. It can help you do your job faster, but it's not going to build a house for you. It's not going to teach you how to build a house. You know, you still need to pull it out and you need to know how to use it and whatnot. So it's definitely 
you know, to use the Photoshop example, I don't know what we were doing before Photoshop, but Photoshop's given people with no artistic ability a little more of an opportunity to manipulate things with their limited skill set. And so I think AI is kind of like that. It's made it easier, but it's almost made it too easy. And you think like, you know, it's like there's some people that are thinking like, oh, wow, it took me months to make all my social media posts for the year. And now I can just bust them out in a day. That's great. But are people actually engaging with that stuff that you made that you generated in bulk ahead of time? Like, I think there's going to be this real, it's almost like the bubble. It seems like this bubble that's going to pop and people are going to realize that they're not gaining anything from using all of this AI because they're using it as the solution and not the tool. I like that. I think that's correct. We're running short on time, but there's a couple more questions I want to ask you because your group is pretty big now. I'm sure you've seen a lot of people experiment with successes and failures. What is the most common workflow that you see someone, like let's say affiliate site owner, because your group has a lot of affiliate site owners. What's the most common successful workflow that you're seeing people use in Writer? Is it like they're doing the keyword research, then they put it in some way like Neuron Writer or Phrase, and then they go use the Zim Writer SEO tool and they bulk it up with the bulk blog article. Like walk me through a little bit of that, what you're seeing your community do. You know, and there's just such a wide range of users and I can't just give you groups, unfortunately. I know there's a group that's more focused on the slow methodical approach and they're probably the ones doing it right. You know, they'll use the bulk for a little bit of stuff, but their main workflow is going to be going to Neuron Writer or Phrase or Surfer or something, getting those long tail keywords and then, you know, obviously doing the research first, HREF or SEMrush, finding the articles in the silos that they want to create. They'll go to the SEO tools, get the on-page keywords that are important. They'll go to the SEO writer. They'll methodically craft their outlines based on the competition, their H2s, their H3s and whatnot. They'll put in the keywords. They'll get the right tone of voice and all the right settings. They'll generate the article. And if it's an affiliate article, they might even put in you know URL from Amazon or whatnot and, and scrape those to write those articles. But then when they're done, they don't just publish it. Then they'll spend you know, a couple hours, depending on how much of a money article it is, going through it. And that's what sets the winners apart from the losers, I believe. Because there's no sense, if you're not going to do that, you're not going to do that, that editing step. Why are you even using the SEO blog writer? You know, I don't even, unless it's like a zero difficulty keyword or something like that, where anything will rank. But then in that situation, just use the bulk writer. So there's those people. And then there's other people who are just blasting out thousands and thousands of articles. And some of them are having success. What's the extent of their success? I don't know, but they're just creating like hundreds of sites and then blasting out thousands of articles. And maybe they have that SEO knowledge to approach it methodically, but also fast, but maybe they don't. And they'll come to the realization in three months that they'd spent a bunch of money and they don't have any results. And then there's other people who will do the local stuff. They're just local focused. I know one user had spent, I think a couple thousand dollars just generating local open AI credits you know, generating thousands and thousands of local SEO stuff for users. And that's really hard to screw up. You just create a bunch of local landing pages with your locations plus your cities, you know, and ZimWriter will just do hundreds of that. So you get different groups, you know, and then you get people that just use the magic commands are completely happy with that. So it's all over the place. Uh, that's awesome, man. The first writer I saw on the chopping blog was like the local marketing writer, which is how I got my start. Because again, like plumbing in Ohio, like yeah. no one's reading that stuff, right? So you don't need no. to be a very skilled copywriter. Like no one's reading your 2000 word article on how to fix pipes in your Chicago apartment. Right? They, just, <laughs> they would just want to call the plumber. <laughs> like that's purely just for Google. <laughs> this is why I always upset my B2B marketing friends at the SaaS world. They think everything needs to be this like, high grade complex marketing funnel because it does an enterprise SaaS, but like for your local plumber it's much simpler than that like no one like I said, yes. no one's reading that <laughs> but i love that there's so many uses that you got going on is there anything that like when should someone use the seo writer and when should someone use something like the bulk blog writer i think you kind of already mentioned it, but i would like clarity of that for the audience well if you're and whether it's zim writer or whether it's another tool you know, ZimWriter doesn't claim to be, I don't claim it to be everything to everybody, you know, it's another tool in the toolbox. And if it serves your needs, then use it. And if it doesn't, you know, whatever makes it money and makes it an ROI at the end of the day, then <laughs> yeah. use it. So in terms of which to use, I think if you're making a silo and you really want to create that authority piece, 
then you want to go slow and methodically. And it's going to be that SEO optimized article. And you're going to use AI to do it because it's going to get you further faster. You can write that if necessary, that 5,000 word blog post and then edit it. And that's when you're going to use the SEO writer. Would it make sense to use the SEO writer for a zero competition keyword? Probably not. As long as that's not the direction that the industry is going. Like if you've uncovered something with zero search volume and it's the hot new thing, but nobody knows it yet. Like if you've discovered AI before anybody knows about AI, <laughs> start using that SEO writer. But you know, that's few and far between. So a lot of times I would just use the bulk, but in moderation for non-pillar content, supporting content. And that's what's really great about AI. It can help you build that supporting content. You know, and I don't know what do you draw the line between because Google's hinted if you have too much unhelpful stuff, they'll deway your whole site, you know? Where does that play in? I think a lot of it has to do with staying in your lane. You know, you start writing about everything under the sun, then you're kind of all over the place and you're not going to get a lot of traction. But I think if you stay in your lane and use the bulk generation for non-pillar pieces and the SEO for pillar pieces, you'll be on good footing. Yeah, that makes sense. So we're near the end. We want to do the rapid fire section. But before we do, you told me offline that you have a new newsletter coming out. So let's give that a little bit of a pitch. What's your newsletter going to be all about? Yeah, so it's called Get Prompted. And... The genesis for it was simply, I have seen so much stuff online for prompts. You know, is it okay for me to call them snake oil salesmen and then influencers? <laughs> you go on YouTube and it's like these people and they'll like, you know, they'll do the whole Photoshop on their eyes and their eyes are balled out and they're like, oh, make a million dollars in a day with AI or with chat GPT. And they'll $50 give you a prompts. day with this one simple Etsy design. <laughs> one simple hack, you know? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> It's like the 21st century of lose weight in, you know, in seven days or something like that. <laughs> and I'm like, I'm looking at these prompts and actually the, the whole, I had a user a couple of days ago and he messaged me. He said, can you add this feature to ZimWriter? I want custom prompts. I want to add my own prompts. And I said, well, what are you doing? What are the prompts you're adding? And he said, I like to add these prompts from this guy. He linked a YouTube video. I followed the rabbit trail, ended up on a discord server. This guy has all these prompts. I downloaded a prompt and it's like some massive thing. And and there's like a matrix in there. It's like, a, like imagine an RPG game, but like for an AI. And there's like all these different personality traits and they're all like encoded. So it doesn't say like charisma, it would like CH and stuff like this. And I'm like, either I have totally missed something in the world of AI and I'm just like behind the curve here or this guy's full of nonsense. You know? So I did what any, you know, any smart individual would do. I took the matrix and I went to chat GPT and I said, what is this? And chat GPT <laughs> said, I have no freaking idea. <laughs> it's, it's like, it looks to be some kind of personality matrix and it started taking guesses and stuff. And I'm like, yeah, you don't know either. So this guy's <laughs> totally, totally full of it. That's and and awesome. I, I see crap like this all over the place. And it's just a shame. And GPT-3 is, chat GPT, it's very forgiving. So you can put a lot of crap in and get something that looks reasonable out, you know, but that's not helping you. You're not learning how to prompt. You're not increasing your skills and you're making a mess of just your mindset on how to grow as a prompt engineer. So that's what this newsletter is all about. The TLDR is simply, I am going to take problems that the community sends me. They can sign up for the newsletter and then shoot me a message and say, hey, I'm struggling with this particular thing. And then anonymously, I will respond to that with a video explaining how to fix the prompt, how to solve their issue. If you go to getprompted.ai, there's a link to a 45-minute training video where I dispel the top eight myths that I see time and time again on ChatGPT. All you got to do, enter your email, you get the video, and it truly will help you solve 90% of your prompt mistakes. So definitely check it out. Oh, that's awesome. We'll go check it out. We'll leave that link in the show notes as well. And quick tip on ChatGPT, if you want to make your life harder with AI, you can do what I did, which is make ChatGPT always speak to me in the tone of Edgar Allan Poe, which makes everything oh. very confusing. <laughs> this dark and dreary as he's telling me about some new marketing hack. So if you want a tip to slow yourself down, it's been great for me. ChatGPT really likes it. <laughs> <laughs> start a new chat <laughs> well we're at the rapid fire section so this is where i ask you three questions and you give me just a quick answer are you ready sure yes all right what are the best hidden growth opportunities today for people using ai 
I think finding things that are solving pain points that people have. There was somebody that had like that virtual girl. They were an influencer. They made like a virtual avatar of themselves, you know, and they were charging people a dollar a minute to speak to them. And they were making a total bank. I've used AI headshots. You know, I don't like dressing up in a suit. I send them a couple photos of myself and I get really professional looking headshots. So a lot of these pain points, you know, that if you can find before somebody else does, there's amazing growth there with using AI to solve those problems. Great answer. And that is a fascinating story. I read about the girl who used the digital avatar. <laughs> Great idea. It worked out really well for her. What tools or resources can people use to help them leverage AI better? Obviously, my get prompted newsletter and Zim writer. There we go. That was waiting for it. I, this question was meant for it. <laughs> uh, but, but seriously, you got to think of AI as simply a tool, a, a hammer, or maybe even a miter saw. You know, miter saw, you can do a lot of intricate, detailed, fine craftsmanship with, but you can't just go buy one from the shelf, from Home Depot or whatnot, and then start using it. You have to learn how to use it. You have to use it right and properly. And so the best thing you can do is get the right training but then use it properly. It just comes with experience. Great answer. And now the hardest question, this is the question that decides whether I'm publishing this podcast or not. So <laughs> you, have to, <laughs> you have to answer this one well. Are you ready, Matt? I am ready. Okay, that was the question. So I guess we'll be publishing it. But now oh, the fantastic. Last... <laughs> the, the last Woo! rapid fire question is, what has been your funniest moment working in the online business industry? Funniest moment. Um, probably at the end of the month, I'll release a patch for Zimrider. And then like a thousand people will jump on and use it. And then immediately we'll find, oh, there's a giant bug and nobody can use it anymore. It's broken. And I'm like, crap. And so I'll patch it. And then about 10 minutes later, somebody else, <laughs> something really big. And so somebody like 30 minutes late comes in. He's like, okay, what's the latest version? And it's like five patches later. So I think <laughs> not at the time, but in hindsight, Trying to deliver uh, SaaS functionality in desktop software is funny in hindsight, I think. That's, uh, <laughs> not in the moment, though. <laughs> you have to be there. I love it. Good stuff, man. If someone wanted to reach out to you or try out ZimWriter, what's the best place for them to connect with you and check out the software? You can go to either ZimWriter.com or you can reach me at Matt at RankingTactics.com. I also have a contact form at the bottom of my site. Excellent. Well, Matt, thank you for coming on. I really enjoyed this chat. Thanks for having me. Great time and I hope to do it again soon. Yeah, for sure, man. Talk soon. There you have it. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope it got you inspired at all the different things that are happening in this industry. And of course, if you just want to buy a highly profitable business, you can always go to empireflippers.com slash marketplace. Or maybe you want to make an exit of your highly profitable business, then you could go to empireflippers.com slash sell your site. I've been your host, Greg. If you enjoyed this episode, make sure you leave a review. Give us a like, a follow, share it across social media. Talk to you all soon. See you on the next episode.